Good morning. Hi, my name is Cherise Ford. I'm a Master of Public Administration candidate at Wagner. Good morning, all. My name is Taisha Smith, and I am a Master's of a Public Administration candidate. Hello, my name is James Leba. I'm a candidate for an Urban Planning Master's degree. And hello, my name is Alvin Irby, and I'm a candidate of a Master's in Public Administration at NYU Wagner. So, before coming to NYU, I was a kindergarten teacher in New York City. I want to tell you about one of my students, Deshaun. He was a brilliant, curious kid who loved learning. One day during math, I said, Deshaun, you're a great mathematician. He looked at me and said, I'm not a mathematician. I'm a math genius. I said, OK, Deshaun, that works too. Later that week during reading, it was a completely different story. Deshaun told me, Mr. Irby, I hate reading, and I'm never going to be good at reading. Deshaun's not alone. In New York City, more than 80% of black boys are not proficient in reading. 80%. That means that 8 out of 10 black boys in New York City are not reading on grade level. A recent study found that 22% of black children who are not reading by grade level do not graduate from high school. And another study found that the dropout, the cost of dropout, is about $292,000 over the working life of each dropout. This is a significant policy issue. 14 years ago, No Child Left Behind was created in part to address this very issue. It was created to ensure that every student can read at grade level or above no later than the end of grade three. It also worked to close achievement gaps between minority and non-minority students and between disadvantaged children and their more advantaged peers. These goals have not been realized. And it bothered me. I thought about this walking down the street. I thought about it in the grocery store. I thought about it in the coffee shop. I even thought about it in the barber shop. One day, while getting a haircut, I began to consider the cultural significance of barbershops in black communities. And I want to take a minute just to tell you about black barbershops. They're a cultural center. There's a lot of stuff going on. Around age two or three, boys start getting their hair cut about once or twice a month. We usually wait between 10 and 30 minutes to get our hair cut. And, and families, they usually visit the same barbershop again and again. So that over time, barbers become like a member of the family. So while one day in the barbershop, it hit me. Why not connect reading to barbershops? When I came to NYU with this idea, I realized I was going to need some help. And that's when I found the team of people you see here to get today. Together, we've been working to make this idea a reality. And now, we'd like to introduce you to Barbershop Books. It's a simple idea. Reading spaces in barbershops for black boys ages four to eight. That's it. Each reading space has a bright yellow chair and a colorful book sling. The book sling contains 15 curated titles that are age appropriate, culturally relevant, and gender responsive. These are the books that boys love to read and that even reluctant readers can't resist. For example, Not Norman. Book, this is a book for beginning readers. Boys love this story because they can relate. He didn't want a fish for his birthday. He wanted a dog. Another story, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. This is a book that boys love because it's really funny. It's a beginning chapter book that they really enjoy. These two books really demonstrate the quality and the range of the books in our reading space. Volunteers are an important part of the program. We'll recruit college and graduate students from local universities to volunteer in barbershops on Friday afternoons and on Saturdays, inviting parents in to interact with books and modeling positive reading behaviors and attitudes. Barbers are also key. Barbers will be encouraging parents and boys to read and interact with the books throughout the week. Reading in barbershops can make a difference. Data from the US Department of Education shows that students who read for fun just once or twice a month have significantly higher reading scores than students who hardly, never, hardly ever or never read for fun. We're going to be tracking reading in the barbershops using these cool tracking sheets. 
As boys read books, they circle the books they read, they can give them to a volunteer, they can give them to a barber. We also know that parents are reading at home. We'll be tracking parents reading and boys reading at home using parental surveys that are simple, three to five questions every four months. This is gonna give us a lot of data, but we're gonna to need to find a way to incentivize this. Well, we'll give parents gift cards, and each time boys complete a certain amount of books, they get a free book. With all this data, we're gonna to need to measure our impact. What kind of difference are we making? Well, we're gonna use a combination of outputs and outcomes. We have two outputs that we're gonna be looking at. The number of boys reading in barbershops and how much time they're reading. We're also gonna be looking at outcomes. Our outcomes are about changes. We're gonna be looking to increase the amount of time that boys are reading at home. We're gonna be looking to increase the amount of time they're reading in barbershops. We're also gonna be wanting to improve their attitudes about reading as well as increasing their confidence in their reading ability. So at this point, you may be wondering, is this program real? Is it happening? The answer is yes. We currently have reading spaces in six New York City barbershops, and two of these barbershops are trendsetters that other barbershops in New York City and across the country that follow them. We estimate that we'll reach 40 boys per barbershop. I want to take a moment and explain how we got to this number. It's not unusual in black barbershops in New York City for 20 boys in our target population, ages four to eight, to come into a barbershop on a single weekend. We're using very conservative numbers. We're saying that if five boys come into the barbershop on the weekend and interact with our space, and five boys come in during the week, that's about 10 boys per week. Over the course of a month, that's about 40 boys. In black barbershops, the same boys come in each month, month after month. So we estimate that we'll reach 40 boys per barbershop per year. In four years, we plan to be in 225 barbershops. 225, that's a conservative growth rate of about 50 barbershops per year over the next four years. If we take the 225 barbershops and the 40 boys, we will have reached 16,000 boys in four years. This number is significant because only 46,000 boys, black boys, ages four to eight, are in New York City public schools. So this ratio, 16,000 and 46,000, represents uh, a ratio that we will have reached about one third, one third of our target population in four years. And the great thing about this is that it's affordable. This year, our cost will be just above $8,000, and the majority of this will be the cost of books, book slings, and chairs. And as we move forward, the majority of our expenses will continue to be books, book slings, and chairs. Even if we hire a bunch of staff and we only get 5% of our participants to read on grade level by grade three, we still would have a social return on investment of nearly $24. That means that for every $1 invested in barbershop books, society won't have to pay $24 for costs associated with high school dropout. We know that early literacy interventions have a significant impact on high school dropout rates. We're really excited to have already partnered with a number of literacy organizations and programs, and we're looking forward to reaching out to a number of big brands who also have literacy initiatives and programs. We're currently in conversations with individuals at the White House's My Brother's Keeper initiative, which focuses on increasing opportunities for boys of color. They have stated that all children should be reading on grade level by age eight. This language directly addresses the failed policy of no child left behind. If there's one thing that I want you to remember about barbershop books, I want you to remember that we're getting boys reading. We're using barbers and volunteers to bring boys into the wonderful world of books so that if you see Deshaun and you ask him about reading, he won't, he'll say, I'm not a great reader, I'm a reading genius. We're Barbershop Books, thank you very much. Can, can you do that $23.80 savings for me? Can you break it down? 
Sure, so to calculate the social return on investment, we use three figures. We use the total cost um, per high school dropout, then we took the percent of, percent of boys that are dropping out of high school if they're not reading on the third grade, and then we took the percent of, um, we took the percent of target population of boys that Barbershop Books program will reach. My uh, compliments on your budget. It's um, very detailed in terms of what you expect over the next uh, five to six years. Um, but I do believe that you probably have underestimated how much you're going to get in terms of donations, in terms of in-kind donations and other support from some of the book companies and others. Can you talk about how you've reached out to create some of these partnerships that you already have and tell us the nature of those at this point? And Bill, can I add what the timeline has been? So you got your group together after you started your program. Has this happened since you decided to enter the Fells Challenge? So has this been since February or January or last November as part of this challenge competition? So timeline and Bill's question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so to answer the first question about partnerships, so. Uh, since the competition has started, we've reached out to Barnes and Nobles, and recently um, a community, community relations manager at one of the stores actually um, suggested bringing barbers from our sites into a Barnes and Nobles bookstore to cut boys here in the bookstore. That's one example of an event. Other events that we've um, had and other ways we've partnered have been uh, with uh, Scholastic's FACE program, Family and Community Engagements. That's where all the books from the reading spaces come from. They uh, sell uh, low-cost books to programs that serve primarily low-income uh, students. And then also, we've partnered with libraries to advertise read-aloud events in barbershops, where they have actually distributed flyers to the, the barbershops, and I mean to the libraries in Harlem, and they've posted them in the libraries. Um, so that's just a few examples of some of the partnerships that we've already had. And Two questions. One, um, this presumes that uh, the boy knows how to read to begin with. For him to open the book and start reading, he has to have that basic literacy with him. The second question is, how is this different than a boy going to uh, school every day and they would have library, they would have these books while he would be going to barbershop once or maybe twice a month. So I can see this as an additive uh, function but the basic premise here is that he has to know how to read and I think that is where the fundamental problem is that this project presumes it already and two, that he would be exposed to books, elementary books, in KG or uh, in, in elementary schools. And then if he is to some extent hooked on books, then it is equally possible that he may be going to a neighborhood library. But put aside library for a moment, at least he goes to school every day. Thank you for the question. We, uh, we at Barbershop Books are not looking to substitute for schools. Uh, schools are where learning takes place. We're about making learning fun, or uh, reading fun, and this is a place where the barbershop itself is a place where we see an intersection of boys coming in as well as an opportunity to read. Additionally, your point around, uh, the, um, around being able to read in the first place, that is excellent if that's the case, if the boy comes in with beginning reading skills, but we see parents actually coming in and helping out in the reading process as well. And the same parent would not help him in libraries? So what Barbershop Books is trying to do is to bring books to where children are, and we know that boys are coming to barbershops. Um, a big component of barbershop books is about connecting uh, reading to a space where there's black men. Uh, less than 3% of teachers in the U.S. are black men, and in elementary it's well below 1%. Um, barbershops are a place 
where you have an intersection of black men from different economic levels with different reading interests. And so barbershops, in combination with our volunteers and parents, create an opportunity for lots of modeling to take place um, and for lots of in interactions with books. And so those are some of the key kind of uh, distinguishing characteristics between schools um, and, and the barbershops is the black males uh, interacting in the space. Now, I have, to, <clears throat> I have to continually reassure you that I find great passion in your work, and this is a great idea, <clears throat> but I still have a problem with your, your, your delivery mechanism. So, <clears throat> in your proposal, you say there are five main obstacles that create this problem of low literacy among young black boys. It appears that you've only addressed one of those problems through your proposal, and that is the lack of black men and black boys' early reading experiences. You haven't addressed ineffective <coughs> reading instruction in the school, lack of culturally competent teachers, limited access to engaging books, and early childhood ed classrooms that don't incorporate black boys' reading preferences. I'm all the more concerned because you, Alvin, are an educator. So is it fair to conclude that you have completely dismissed the role of the public school system in addressing this problem, and that somehow, magically, it's going to have to be addressed outside of the school system? Um, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, you are absolutely right that um, there are a lot of parts of this problem. And um, Barbershop Books is addressing uh, m a number of those issues. So the issue of boys not having access or early childhood classrooms, not incorporating books that uh, include boys' reading preferences, the books that we've chosen uh, reflect uh, both the gender responsive in terms of books that are, have male main characters. Research shows that boys like, young boys like books that have male main characters and they're action oriented. Those are books that we've included in our reading space. Also, um, in terms of the titles that we, cho we chose for our reading space, we, we asked boys, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, we asked boys, what are the books that you would like to be in the space? They told us we put those books into the reading space. Um, and that increases their access to culturally relevant, age appropriate, and gender responsive books. Um, and then, um, your, I want to make sure that I'm answering um, all of your questions. And then in terms of all the different, we're just one part of a multi-pronged solution. We're bringing books to this space to create a love of reading. And that doesn't mean that after school programs or schools can't do that. I believe that there are a lot of after school programs and schools that are doing that. But it's really important, I believe, and we believe, for, for boys to understand that learning isn't something that's restricted to a classroom or to a school, but it's actually something that can happen anywhere. And we want them to know that barbershop books and the barbershops is another place where they can read. So is it possible that as a result of these young boys participating in this program, <clears throat> that you could find that it translates into their school experience? So for example, you have no way of going back to their teachers and finding out if now these young boys are reading better in class, that they are reading their assignments better. In other words, it's got to be more than a social experience. It's got to be an educational experience as well. And I just want to see how you're linking those two and how you're evaluating <coughs> the impact that you are, are having with this program. Thank you for the question. Um, so uh, one of the things that we're going to be looking at, as we mentioned, are our metrics. I think that's really key to knowing that we're going to, that we're having the impact and making the impact that we desire to have for this population of boys. So, uh, you know, we talked about four elements to our, uh, to our outcomes, and this is sort of the increased time that they're reading in the barbershops, the increased time that they're reading at home, uh, their um, confidence in their reading ability, and their attitudes towards reading. So we understand, and research has shown, 
shown that if we see improvements in those areas, that there is a correlation to uh, improvements in their reading achievement, which you know we hope to see and translate it in sort of their academic achievement. And because of the partnerships through our volunteers that we hope to have with parents, I think that that's some really uh, interesting anecdotal information that we can also seek to capture. Can you talk a little bit about your structure of your implementation and how you will expand, what, what criteria you will use for moving forward? Uh, so we have four criteria that we take into consideration. Um, the, those four include census data, uh, school data, barbershop's willingness, um, and there's, there's another piece to that. Uh, and there's their willingness, and then there's gonna be a partnership agreement. And so we wanna make sure there, you know, there are a number of barbershops in New York City, uh, but it's really important to us that, we, that we're in spaces that are appropriate for the type of program that we wanna operate moving forward. Um, and barber referrals is the fourth component to that. So we'll be uh, looking at those criteria and making decisions about where we grow moving forward. So do you see yourself forming a 501c3 a, a, a nonprofit corporation for this? Are you going to partner with another organization to do that? So beyond year two in your executive summary, what is the structure for implementation um, in New York City and beyond? Um, so, uh, so there currently is a 501c3 that was created to kind of house the idea. It was just pretty much an idea. And then what happened is that when I got the team together, we began to kind of come up with like what will the name of this specific program be and what would it look like in flushing out the implementation. But there currently is a 501c3 that was created to house the program that is in currently in existence. Part of, part of what, what I see this as is a, is a family um, engagement enterprise essentially. And so you've talked about tutors with the, or aides in the barbershop with the children and reading with them, et cetera. But the other half of this is the fathers. And I'm just wondering, have you given any thought to how to engage them in particular? Because some of this is really about modeling behavior. And, and, I, and I don't know whether or not the fathers have reading issues, if they're cultural questions. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you've, you've given a lot of thought to one half of the equation. Have you given thought and consideration to the other half? It's a good question. I, our, our target audience, our primary target audience, is the children themselves. And that we're going to have the direct link with the children, the young boys, in the barbershops themselves. Uh, we are you know, supporting the engagement with parents. We're not uh, exclusively looking at fathers or mothers, but through our uh, outreach, through the surveys and through the gift cards in that respect. The volunteers as well are going to be, uh, if you will, modeling the uh, engagement with families, with children, with parents as well and we see that modeling taking place by the barbers as well. Do you have any hope or plan of tracking these young boys after they leave <clears throat> their primary grades, in other words, deeper into the educational experience? Have you thought about the feasibility of tracking them throughout uh, their school careers? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, I mean, I think we're really focused right now on um, just beginning to put together the pieces of uh, the, qu the quantitative data that we want to measure. And I think that's a great suggestion in terms of thinking uh, more longitudinally about the data that we capture for the population of boys that we're serving. So I think we're really excited about um, being very forward looking in terms of the data that we capture and how that can um, result in improvements to the program. Essentially, your, your enterprise is predicated on, um, if I can, at least in my estimation, really just by, um, by getting kids to read more, they're necessarily going to do better. That's it. Whether, whether you, you don't, you're not following them in terms of test scores, as, as you've articulated. And so, um, uh, am, I, am I right? Is that, is that really a fair? Because uh, that's, that's at least how I'm hearing it. The more they read, the better they do. It's just you, based on all the data that you've read and studies that you've read, the more you expose children to books, the better they're going to, they're, the better they're going to read, period. Is that a fair characterization? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's actually all the time we have for questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you. We're Barbershop Books bringing books to barbershops to help boys read. Thank you.